Wow, that was pretty good, wasn't it? That last song was a Chris Tomlin song, I think, the first part of it, and then one that was written in 1953. So you had the combination of decades of people who are interested in the message of church music. And as we were singing that, I was thinking about how uh, diverse our music is and how wonderful that is, and also thinking about something that I should not announce this morning, uh, but I will anyway. Uh, I've been working with the Gospel Music Association, uh, and next October, the Dove Awards will be broadcast nationally from Lipscomb University. Won't that be exciting? (laughs) And uh, those people who are writing and working uh, in not only Southern Gospel music and Black Gospel music, but also contemporary Christian music will all gather in Allen Arena to uh, share uh, the message uh, really with the world. Well, I got up last night and I was uh, trying to figure out what kind of church you were. Uh, I had never been here before. I'm pleased to be here. It's great to be with graduates like Shelby and Jesse and Jesse to come or Shelby to come. I don't know which, but uh, and I often say that students come to us as consumers, but they leave as our product. And I'm thrilled with the product that they are and that they are blessing you. But I got up last night and went on your website to kind of figure out what kind of church you were, and I panicked a bit because obviously in looking at sermon after sermon after sermon that Brad has preached, he never, never wore a tie. Uh, Not in a single video that I saw. (laughs) And and so I was sitting there wondering what I'm supposed to do because I didn't bring the right clothes to be cool and casual and all of that. And so I thought, I guess I'll just dress up and do it. Uh, And then I came and look. (laughs) Come on, stand up, Brad. Let's see you. Look at that. All right. This is the way it's supposed to be. Preachers are trying to act like lawyers. Isn't that wonderful? Well, it is a joy to be with you. And I want to share something with you that I thought was funny. You may not, but I thought this was funny. It was Easter Sunday morning, and I was driving to preach somewhere in Nashville. And I'm driving toward that church on this rather special day that, well, we don't think about too often, but once a year it comes around. And I'm driving, and I'm driving past a kind of family-owned, I would guess, little cafe kind of place. And there's a sign out front. It's one of those signs where you can put up the black letters and have a message or spell things out or or whatever it might be. And you may not think this is funny at all, but I drove by and here's what it said. It said, Christ is risen. Not bad. I mean, it's Easter Sunday. And the second line was, hamburger steak, $5.99. Now, now think about that just for a second, because doesn't that define the ends of this spectrum? The greatest, most significant event in the history of humankind, Christ is risen. And then the rather mundane, after you go to church and celebrate all of that, come back here, we have hamburger steak today for $5.99. What a contrast. But it caused me to begin to think again about resurrection and the fact that I, probably with you, celebrate Easter maybe once a year. It's a moment where we focus, the world pauses a bit, or at least some of it, and we celebrate in this glorious kind of way this very, very significant event. And then a week or two later, we're just kind of back in the routine for the rest of the year. And yet... And yet, that is the most important, the most significant, the most pivotal moment in our faith. Because if that did not happen, there's no reason to come on Sunday morning. There's no reason to be involved in the ministries of this church. There's no reason to share a story. If Easter didn't happen, if resurrection didn't happen... Well, as the Apostle Paul said, we among all the people should be most pitied. 
And so I want to think with you a moment about resurrection, and you'll do more of that in the next couple of weeks. But I want to thank you, think with you for just a moment about what happened there, and I want this morning, if I can leave with you just three words. And those three words come out of our text. Those three words are the invitation that in just a minute or two will be yours. Think about what led up to it. Well, we saw some in the video just a moment ago. I mean, here was this sense that Jesus and his ministry and his followers had anticipated, although it doesn't turn out quite like he wanted or they wanted. Oh, they wanted a king. They wanted someone who would set things right. They wanted someone who would tell the world the way things really should be, and they left everything to follow him for that moment, and it wasn't to be. That Friday came, and all of a sudden, the one they'd followed, the one they'd given all for, was being hung on a cross. And most of them just left, not understanding at all what was going on. And so we have these words in the 28th chapter of Matthew. And after the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus Jesus who was crucified, he is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see the place where he lay. Those three words, come and see, are the focus of my comments for just a moment. Come and see what God has done. Well, we can go back historically and look at this moment. We can go back through all the evidences and all of those who have studied this and try to sort out what has happened here historically. Now, there are a lot of voices out there that would suggest something other than our biblical interpretation, our biblical understanding should win the day. There are those who say, well, he really didn't die on the cross, and thus no resurrection took place. Or others that said, some stole his body just so we wouldn't have this uncomfortable and difficult moment. And down through the ages, there's been reason after reason after reason this did not happen. But we have to look back 2,000 years and decide if, in fact, it did. It is interesting that those who were very, very close seem to believe it. All four of our Gospels have resurrection as a moment uh, that's at the end of the story of his time on this earth. And the disciples, the closest ones to him, didn't continue searching for the Messiah that was to come because they believed they had found the Messiah who did come. And almost all of them gave their lives for that belief. But we still have trouble. It's 2,000 years later and history is not easy for us to understand and the evidences are not so certain that we don't at times doubt in fact, it's hard to believe in something we can't explain. And that comes out of where we are in this kind of industrial age and enlightenment and all of that. We believe we should be able to explain everything, and we do so analytically, not leaving room for anything that's spiritual. And yet, not long ago I lost my telephone, and the school decided to replace my telephone with an iPhone. And so I have this wonderful little instrument that I don't understand. <laughs> now, I am a relatively bright guy. I try to be fairly intellectual, but I don't understand how it works. 
I don't understand that I could leave 4005 Franklin Avenue in Nashville and I could punch in the address of this church in Huntsville and it brings me to the parking lot. How does that work? Is there a little person inside who has a lot of maps? And when I punch it in, he starts looking through them and finally finds out and tells me, how does that work? Or Shazam, any of you have that? Oh, I hear a song on the radio, I stick this up to it. The little guy inside knows every song ever recorded. (laughs) And he can listen to the song, just hum a few bars of it, and he can tell me what the song is and who else recorded it And then he can tell me that for 99 cents, I can download it and put it in here too. I can put my songs right in here. Or we were in in Spain several years ago, and Rhonda wanted some coffee. And she kind of said, you know, boy, I'd love to have a cup of Starbucks. And I thought, now how in Barcelona, Spain, am I supposed to find Starbucks? And then I remembered what? My Starbucks app. Now I have an app. All I have to do, Rhonda, is press Starbucks. And he knows where it is. He not only knows where it is, he gives me directions on how to walk there. Now, some of you in this town are engineers. Some of you are very, very bright. And some of you, if you took long enough with me, could actually explain this. But I can't. I have no idea how it works but it's very, very real. And maybe the resurrection is something like that. We have no idea how to fully explain it, but that doesn't mean it's not very, very real. Well, the history is hard, so so maybe... Maybe one thing that might help us understand that history that we can't explain are the things that happen around us that we can't help but believe are very, very real. See, I have a sense that God back then said, I will bring life to moments of death. And God does that today. Well, maybe not exactly in the same way, but it seems to me that The invitation to come and see has a historical kind of connotation. The invitation come and see also has a very, very current one. That even in our lives, we witness this transformation. Oh, we did with Taylor just a few moments ago. Here is the symbolism of a life, uh, and here is symbolism of God bringing life. And there we see the death and the burial and the resurrection in in this wonderfully symbolic sacrament of baptism. But maybe even more personally in your lives, you've had moments where you would say, there's a bit of death, there's a bit of sorrow and disappointment, at times so overwhelming, and, and yet eventually God brought life. When I was 12 years old, I played Little League. It was my first year to play Little Leagues. I didn't grow up with a dad. I didn't have anybody that was real athletic in the family. But at 12 years old, my first year in the Little League, I played in what we called the majors. It was the last year kids could play. And they'd all been playing year after year after year. And I'm the skinny little guy who joined the team as a 12-year-old. I had a wonderful coach who actually was a a trash man, a garbage collector, but a wonderful, wonderful spirit. Uh, And and he he brought this spirit to us every time we practiced, every time we played. But then there was the very last game of the season. And after that game, the team gathered, and, and the coach started passing out sheets of paper to each one of us. And on the paper, it was, I think, an old mimeographed sheet, Most of you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. Uh, But it was mimeographed, so I was thinking of blue or purple or something. And he passed this out to all the kids, and I got mine. It had our stats for the season, and it had us ranked in order. And so my eyes started at the top of that and started going down, trying to find where I would be in terms of my batting average. And I went all the way down to the bottom of the sheet. 
There I was. Randy Lowry. Batting average, point zero, zero, zero. I never got a hit the entire year, my entire career. Now that doesn't mean I didn't get on base because I learned something. I learned at that age, if you leaned over far enough, they would hit you. They would. And so I got hit all the time on my left shoulder, and so I got to run on bases, but I never had a hit. And for a 12-year-old standing in that circle, it was a moment of death. You've experienced that. And yet God, God is a God that brings life. And God is a God that perhaps doesn't do it right then, and it's perhaps not as obvious to us, but God, I think, is about bringing life. So now it's probably 50 years later, and I'm president of Lipscomb University. We play Division I athletics in the Atlantic Sun, a conference that goes from northern Kentucky all the way down to southern Florida. And the presidents run the athletic conference. And the 12 of us representing 12 universities get around a table and make all the decisions for these athletic programs. And they pass the presidency around. And it was about three years ago, I was president of a Division I conference <laughs> in the NCAA. And I made sure that none of the other presidents ever heard about my baseball experience. <laughs> but there I was, president of the Atlantic Sun. God is a God who brings life. <laughs> and somehow renews us even in those difficult moments. I don't know about this church, although I have a sense of it. I have a sense that sometimes you have not always been accepted by every other Church of Christ in town. And frankly, I lead a university that isn't accepted by every other Church of Christ or otherwise. And I used to get really frustrated that I couldn't convince people. And I'd try to do all of this stuff to say, no, we're okay. No, we're faithful. Look at what's going on. And I finally said, you know, there's no reason to do that. I don't need to try to justify from a human sense what's going on. All I really have decided to do is share from a God-blessed experience what's happening in this university community. And so I do. People criticize or people concerned about something, and I simply say, come and see. Come and see a university that is at the top of its game academically, where a university used to be thought of as training teachers and accountants and preachers, and we still do that, but the number one major at Lipscomb University is pre-med. 190 students in next year's class. Come and see that academically we are doing just fine and also see that every one of those students will take 18 credits of Bible. They will all leave with a minor in Bible. That just doesn't happen at every college in America. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see a program that's ranked number three in the nation in terms of the service that our students do in the community. That's according to Washington Monthly, not me. And come and see these students who, who have this spirit of service and work with 120 nonprofit organizations and are changing the face and the experience for people in Nashville, Tennessee. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see the moments where you look around and see our student body and they don't all look the same. Come and see the 150 or 200 Hispanic and first-generation students who we welcome in the community because Jesus would have welcomed them in his community. Come and see the students who on Wednesday night leave the campus because their class is at the Tennessee prison for women. I don't know what they say to their parents if they talk right beforehand, but my mama went to class and classes at prison, and, and when they get there, there'll be a Lipscomb professor, and there'll be 15 Lipscomb students and 15 women dressed in blue, the inmates. And together they study for 15 weeks together. Come and see. 
Come and see the two inmates have now been released and we're proud are in our student body. Come and see the transformation in their lives. Come and see the 200 veterans at Lipscomb, all of whom have fought in either Afghanistan or Iraq, have fought longer in combat than the average World War II veteran. Come and see them in our student body and know that every single one of them has a tuition-free education. Come and see. Come and see in just a week or so as 600 students and faculty will board buses and planes and go to 25 different countries doing mission work over spring break. Come and see. And isn't that the message we ought to have as a congregation in this community? As Christian people gathered here, shouldn't our message not be so much on arguing over this or that, but just simply the very same invitation that the angel gave to Mary, come and see what God is doing among his people. There's the testimony. There's the message. Come and see. We'll have Resurrection Week in just a week or so at Lipscomb. It's just a time that people are thinking about Easter, and so we'll try to capture that week. Last year during Resurrection Week, I, I, I decided I would speak in chapel after being encouraged, and I spoke to 2,500 students, and we did something we don't usually do. We actually offered an invitation in the middle of chapel. I didn't know what would happen. We sang an entire song, and nothing happened. But then we sang another one, and another one. And 60 to 70 students came down into the arms of faculty and staff who were standing in the front there. 32 were baptized by 10 o'clock that night, including our first Muslim student. Come and see. God is a God of life. And so we think about that historically, we think about that in our own lives, and then I think what we can do is we can look forward and say, he's not through yet. We can anticipate that even in this life, he is going to bring to us over and over and over life in those moments of death. One of my acquaintances is Senator Bill Frist, who is a former senator from the state of Tennessee, former majority leader in the Senate. But before that, and once again, he is one of the world's great heart transplant surgeons. Bill Frist pioneered the transplanting of hearts into children. And he was on campus a number of months ago sharing what it's like to transplant a human heart. He said, it'll be kind of like this. It'll be 2 o'clock in the morning. I'll get a telephone call from Vanderbilt. They'll say, Dr. Frist, you need to get up. There'll be a car to pick you up in just a few minutes. Uh, we have a transplant. And he said, I'll get up. I'll get dressed. The car will be there. They'll take me to the airport. I'll hop on an airplane. I'll go somewhere within an hour and a half of Nashville. And I'll get off the plane at that airport. I'll run to a medical center. I'll walk into a surgical suite. And there the donor will be. Oh, there'll be lots of attendants, lots of physicians, lots of people around, but there will be someone who is clinically dead being kept alive for this particular moment. And he said, we'll scrub, we'll dress, we'll go to work, and we will actually take out that person's heart. And he said, we'll take that heart that was beating a few moments ago, that heart that is warm, and we'll actually put it in an igloo ice chest, just like they use on the construction sites. And we'll pack it with ice. And then it's back in the car, back to the airport, back in the plane, arrive at Nashville, an ambulance will be waiting, and rush us down to Vanderbilt. And in a few moments, I'll walk into another surgical suite. And there, there will be the person who's going to receive that heart. And here are all the nurses and here are all the doctors and they work sometimes for an hour, sometimes for two hours. They have to get all this done in about four and a half hours and they finally get it all done and he said, then there's the moment, uh, the moment that is sacred in nature as we all kind of step back and someone over here adjusts some dials and pretty soon, warm blood begins to flow to that cold 
still heart. And he says, we'll all stand there watching. We'll watch, and in a moment it will begin to quiver. And then in a moment it will begin to beat. And we'll know that once again, something we can't explain has happened. He says no matter how good we are and how talented we are and how educated we are, none of us in the room can explain how that happens. But somehow that heart knows that when the blood is warm, it's supposed to beat. You don't believe in resurrection? Ask the person who just received the heart. Ask the person who had no chance at all. Ask the person who was also dead about resurrection, a life-giving God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this, this account of this amazing moment, pivotal moment in our faith. As we think about resurrection, we simply ask that you allow us to come and see the empty tomb that you allow us to come and celebrate the fact that Jesus was raised. And we ask that you allow us to come and to receive the life that you offer. In Christ we pray.